So three things, prosperity, abundance, and giving, that contribution back to society. So here's my kids, pretty much in a straight line, always good to see. Um, so Ben, Jack, Katie, and Emily. Um, and we have this, this challenge, as I'm sure many of you do. You know, what do you do with pocket money for, for children? Um, so we, our first debate was, is it given or is it earned? So we give our children um, but about 20 pounds a month. But we wanted to do something different. We wanted to teach them and values. Yes, we wanted them to learn how, how money is precious and how to save. But wealth comes in many different forms and economic wealth is only one form. Okay, so how could we do that? So this is, this is what we do each month for every one of the children. And they know this, they work with us and very carefully on this and they're really passionate about it. So off the 20 pounds, the first 20% before they even get it, gets transferred into a savings account. My coach might not seem a lot, but to them, four pounds is a lot of money. But it's the point of principle that we're trying to trying to endure with them. And then the second lot is ten percent, and that goes across into a giving pot. And then the third lot is the remaining seventy percent, and you can see the numbers per month: four pound, two pound, fourteen pound, at twenty pounds. The final seventy percent is there to spend. And on my word, have they spent it? They really are. We've had more plastic toys and goodness knows what. But you know what? We decided, Sharon and I, I mean, we, I think, really? Not some more slime come through Amazon, surely? <laughs> um, that seems to be the latest thing. But we believe in allowing our children to make mistakes. We'll try and encourage them not to, but I'd much rather a mess up with a fiver than £50,000 <coughs> later in life. Okay, so the important thing we do at the end of the, the month or at the end of the quarter is we sit down and review with them. Now it's not a board meeting, there are only kids for goodness <laughs> sake. But um, like Alan Sugar banging the table, how much yeah. slime can one child buy? Um, but we just review and it might be a list of their purchases and maybe they could go and find their purchases. And generally they can't find most of them because it's just vaporised somewhere in the, in the Stokes household. Um, but what they do with the 10% giving is all four children put it together and then once a year at the end of the year they contribute that to one pot um, which is which is a reasonable size amount there's four of them so it's about 100 quid um, and that's gone to help for heroes um, RNLI Lifeboat Institute in the past so many different areas and, and they, they love writing a letter and, and sending off a, a check and Maybe they'll get a little, you know, a little document back or something. It just helps them uh, understand that they're in a position they should be grateful that, for the life that they've got. So everything we try and make in balance. But I just want you to focus on this one word here. Because whilst that all sounds great, savings, it's a bit of a challenge really. Because actually we felt by putting their money into savings, we were teaching them to put their money into something and just stand back and allow it to rot. Mm -hmm. Which, in effect, that's what it did. Didn't happen for our parents. They were at 13, 14, 15% interest rates. But for us, you know, it's rotting there at, you know, well, you know, half percent, one percent. So we decided to do something a little bit different. You can, I trust you'll find your way through Facebook and find us, but uh, if you want to see me after, um, you can follow us. So we started doing something with Emily. Now my Emily, this is, this is Emily. Emily's um, just turned seven years old. And so I've got, I've got about 12 years with my Emily until she's, she's 18. So what can, what can I do to make a meaningful, impactful difference on her life? Now what I could do is <coughs> teach her some life skills teacher confidence finding her why really at the age of six she just wants to play you know <laughs> which is great yeah that's confidence building um, but gradually just introducing very gently a few little areas that supplement her play so there isn't any work for her. it's all it's all a measure of, of play and fun 
but we're teaching her very subtly some values. And I want to teach those values in monetary terms as well as all the other forms of, of wealth that are available as well. And that in true includes uh, resilience of income and giving. So, Emily's got around about, she's nearly seven, she's got around about a thousand pounds in the bank from christening, from uh, Christmases, birthday money, yeah, that, that sort of thing, and uh, uh, pocket money savings and things. If that stays at less than 1% in the bank for the next 12 years, when she's 18, that £1,000 will be worth a princely <coughs> £1,105, and won't her daddy be proud of the efforts he put into that? Not. I just put a poll out there to see what else could I get. And I, I've not actually tracked it down, but somebody told me, and I'll take them at face value for now, that there is an ISA at 6%. But even at 6%, a thousand pounds now in 12 years, it's not particularly inspiring. That it'd be about 1,819 pounds. I wasn't really happy with that, to be honest. Uh, I wasn't happy for her, and I can't really look her in the eyes if, if I'm not doing the, uh, the best for her. But more importantly, what values have we taught Emily? Stick the money in bank and forget it. Let others take care of it. Oh yeah, and they'll take some fees as well. How many fees they may be. And we'll just do nothing with the money and we'll expect it to materially um, morph into a huge sum 12 years on. Well, it's not going to happen, you know that. But think how much money is in child savings accounts. Okay? <coughs> Mine was for, for years, and my children's money has been for, for years until I started to decide to do something else. So this is what we decided to do. Okay, we've got a, we've got quite a substantial amount of property, but we took one property and it had X amount of money left in. Okay, let's say, say 25,000 pounds of money left in, nice, nice decent size HMO, throwing off quite a bit of cash. So we thought, well, where can we, where can we get that £25,000 from? We could get it from our own resources as, as a private investor with another hat on, um, or we could deploy some of our children's funds to that. So this is the logic. If we put some of our £1,000 out of £25,000 required, that's 4%, is it not? So if we put 4% of that, that uh, remaining funds in, then would it be fair that they get a contribution of the cash flows each year? Over 12 years. 4% of cash flows every month for 12 years. The interest of that going into the bank over 12 years. You can see where I'm going with this, can't you? It's active. The loan Going to put, I put the loan at 6%, same as the ISA. If they loan a thousand pounds to us, we'll give them 6% on their money. So that's another stream of income. And I put in bold their capital appreciation. Who knows where property prices will go? I've got a few property prices in Hull and Grimsby, and they certainly haven't gone anywhere in the last 12 <laughs> years, really. Um, but you know, depending on where you invest, it, it's the principle. So, is it possible to change that thousand pounds into? 7,120 by being creative. And you know what? What have I got to lose? What has Emily got to lose? Well, a thousand pounds, she could put that in a shoebox in the cupboard. And what have I lost for Emily? 105 pounds of upside potential in the bank. Do you know what? I'm prepared to take that risk. It's a little bit of effort. She sees a spreadsheet, or she will do as she gets a little bit older. But that's just one example where you can start to engage your kids um, and just get that little bit of income. Now, Emily, she's not that really aware of it at her age, but I know what the older ones are. You know, when they get to 12, 13, 14, okay? Because they'd much rather be getting this type of income than dragging themselves out of bed at half past six to do a paper round in the morning. Has anybody here tried to get a teenager out of bed at half six in the morning? My goodness. So how many times? I've said Emily's seven. She's got a thousand pound in the bank. Do you think there's a chance in the next 12 months, she's going to, 12 years, she's going to have more Christmases and more birthdays? Do you think she can generate a few more pounds? 
So how many more times can she do that? Could she do that four more times? Three more times? Times that? I'd like to think we can really help Emily along the way. I don't believe in giving my children anything, placing it right in front of them. But I do believe in giving them the leg up so that they can embrace the opportunity and really feed off that. That's what I do believe. And knowing what you believe and knowing what you don't believe are two most important things in your life. Warren Buffett, I must just tell you a story here. 1992, I was working in the US for a large contractor called Peter Kiewit and Sons. And Peter Kiewit and Sons have uh, their head office in Omaha, Nebraska. And who else has got their head office in Omaha, Nebraska? Warren Buffett. Where is his office? In Kiewit Plaza. So one day we'd, we'd finished work and we went across to a steakhouse and there was a guy sat in the corner having a, a glass of red wine and having his food and the guy I was with was VP of operations or something. Um, we went and had a beer and this, this elderly gentleman called us across and they knew each other and uh, we sat there for a couple of hours with Warren Buffett. Um, way back in 1992. And at that point, Warren Buffett was worth about 2.38 million. And since 1992 to now, his wealth has gone up by 56 billion. And quite frankly, mine hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Always take the opportunity that's in front of you. I'm not ashamed to say that I didn't actually know who, who Warren Buffett was. And he was a billionaire at that time, but the significance, very humble individual, didn't have anywhere near the press that he did then. But yeah, that's, uh, there you go, I've just bared my soul to you. You'll think I'm an idiot, I'll be leaving at the break. <laughs> um, anybody seen Sir Ken Robinson? Sir Ken Robinson. This guy, well, I mean, it just gives you an idea here. Imagination is the source of all human achievement. Okay, we were born with imagination and creativity. <coughs> but from the moment we came out the womb, we generally get herded into conforming to a system. Okay, so <coughs> as entrepreneurs, we like to be creative. But that's why we're quite contrarian to, to modern society. And Sir Ken Robinson, I'd like to do me a favour. I'd like you to look him up on YouTube. If you do look him up on YouTube, you will join the, pretty much the rest of the world who have made him the most hits on any TED talk. Okay, I think 13 and a half million views on, uh, on uh, um, there we go, 13.6 million. And he talks about that creativity and this isn't anti-establishmentarianism. You know, I don't believe uh, in a crusade against schools. Who believed that we should always outsource our children's education to the schooling system? No, it wasn't designed for that. But yet all the woes of society are blamed on the schooling system. And I'm not going to join the queue of people throwing missiles at the schooling system. So please, have a, have a look at that. YPM magazine, this month, who's got this month's edition? Page 53, who's read on my article? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, so yeah, it was it, really humbling. Uh, so Victoria, page 53. It's going to be a blindingly good seller. <laughs> is that the December issue? I think that's November, isn't it? Are you in December? December, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it's uh, just a you know, good bit of fun there, but hopefully some some, some real nuggets there. And I've just started doing uh, my podcast, Inspiring a Young Entrepreneur. Has anybody listened to my podcast? Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Um, so if you've, got, if you've got your iPhones there, go on to the podcast app, Inspiring a Young Entrepreneur. Please have a listen. I, it's really throwing me out of my comfort zone, to be honest. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm giving it a go. and. Um, we had uh, Bill Morrow of, of Angel's Den at Brooklyn's the other day and uh, I, I was fortunate enough to, to record a, an hour-long podcast with him. 
Wow, that guy's incredible. Do you know, during that podcast, he knew it was obviously for young entrepreneurs. And in an hour and six minutes, no swear words, not a thing. And then we went over to Mercedes-Benz World for PPM Brooklands. Oh my God, had he held back. <laughs> it was like a torrent, it was an avalanche. But anyway, look, please visit that. Give us a few stars if, if you would, that would be fantastic. Um, but to me, it's all about incubating entrepreneurs. That's what childhood's about. Look at that lad there. Has he got a great childhood? He could be anything he wanted to be. And that's what we need to bring our children up. Not to conform. I don't want my children to conform. I want them to actually know that they can achieve boundaryless opportunities. I want them to relish and embrace and learn from failure. Okay, we look, failure is part of evolution. I want them to encourage problem solving and embrace that adversity. Allow decision making. Like, what we're trying to do, we're not doing it always right, I say humbly as a parent, but allowing that decision making as a, as a parent um, for pocket money as an example. Nurture a passion for self-improvement, trying to master at least something and, and something that they're passionate about. And feeling that hunger to challenge, redefining those, those normalities and giving back. In Equa Group, Equa is about equality, it's about creating shared value. That's really important to us. I worked in that construction industry where it just robbed the bodies and bayoneted the wounded all the time. If I wanted more profit, Tom, it meant you were gonna get less. I spent 26 years in that environment. If you look bigger at the, the, the wider society, and we have the opportunity to do this as property entrepreneurs and business entrepreneurs in general, we have the opportunity to really make impacts far out with of our own individual contribution. So I want to think of failure differently. Eloise Reistat, we give ourselves permission to fail. At the same time, we give ourselves permission to excel. Absolutely true. And this is what most people think, you know, there's a divergent path, you either succeed or fail. You know, where, where did you get that in your schooling system? Who recognizes that? That's, that's what I recognise. I fail every single day. And I want my children to understand what that feels like and that, that urgency to correct those changes. I don't like failure. I embrace it. I don't like it. It annoys the hell out of me. <laughs> and if we don't, these things are going to happen. We're going to work to build the dreams of others. Okay, we're just going to be impacted every time by change. All those changes from Alibaba, Amazon, driverless vehicles, all those things that are going to change. Did you see tonight, I just put a post out on the brand new electric Lamborghini that's coming out. Tra um, Latin for three. Uh, Travas, tra is it? Is it in Latin or Italian? Italian. Yeah. Tre millennios, I think it is. Third millennium uh, Lamborghini. It's a self-healing vehicle. So it will heal its own dents and cracks blow my mind, but anyway, um, so, so that's a Transformers real life. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so, I mean, you imagine the impact that's going to have on society. So who here wants to be a panel beater? <laughs> <laughs> and your time's going to be dictated by others. And I, I did a podcast on this. Could you have taught me that, Dad? The one thing I can't forgive myself, I can keep, forgive myself for a lot of things. But when my kids are in their 30s, in their 40s, and they find something really inspiring, and they turn to me and think 20 years ago and say, Dad, could you have taught me that? And I know in my heart of hearts, I could have. I couldn't forgive myself. So the time now is to take that action with, with, our, with our children, with our youngsters. So whether you're a godparent, an auntie, an uncle, grandparents, the parent themselves, you know, if you, some people haven't got children. Some people have got children they're you know, really friendly with through, through other relationships. Um, those who may be thinking of starting a family. You know, my Emily's six. Could I have started nine years ago, building Emily's future, as we started to plan a family? Why not? So if we don't, <coughs> The vision in life is just going to be ever decreasingly smaller. 
So the old Chinese proverb, best time to plant a tree 20 years ago, second best time is now. So we only have one life, and what will your children's lives mean? So thank you for, for listening to me for the first half.